the presidency. This is a series with the Vermont League of Women Voters. Our moderator this evening is Marilyn Blackwell. She's a historian and writer from East Montpelier. She will introduce tonight's speakers. And please help me welcome Marilyn Blackwell. Thank you. As you know, most people call me Lynn. Um, I'm a member of the League of Women Voters, and um, pre uh, the president of our local chapter is here, uh, Kate, Kate Rader. Or, or no, is, am I right, Kate? Or, Kate's responsible for organizing, organizing this panel. <laughs> right. Um, anyone can join the League if you're interested. Uh, we are committed to empowering voters and defending democracy. That's our mission. We're nonpartisan. Um, and um, this is part of our uh, educational effort. Orca is filming the program tonight. So I will introduce the panelists, and um, then they will have a chance to give you some introductory remarks from their various perspectives on presidential powers. And uh, we also have some questions that we circulated among them prior to tonight's uh, meeting, uh, so we'll get to those after. We have about an hour for discussion, and then uh, at 8 we would welcome your questions for the for the panelists. So um, with that, our first panelist is um, Lisa Holmes. She is an associate professor of political science at UVM. She specializes in uh, judicial politics, constitutional law, gender and law, and American politics. Her research focuses on various issues surrounding the politics of appointing federal and state judges. So she's going to fill us in on the relationship between the president and, and the judiciary. Um, Matt Dickinson is a professor of political science at Middlebury College. He joined the faculty in 2000 and teaches courses on American politics, the presidency, and the politics of Congress. His current research make sure this is right, Matt, <laughs> focuses on recent presidents, advisors, and presidential decision making. Uh, and Peter Teachout, um, you may have seen before, he's a professor of constitutional law at Vermont Law School. Uh, he is recognized for his expertise in re regarding constitutional law and the history of Vermont and the United States. He's working on a biography of a Verm original Vermonter, <laughs> Thomas Reed Powell. He's from Rich Richford, is that right? Yeah. Uh, who was raised there and uh, became a leading early realist and critic of the court during the first half of the 20th century. So I think Peter will go first and uh, in uh, give you uh, some introduction, which I guess is on this outline. Is that correct, Peter? Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm impressed by the turnout on a night as frosty as this. Uh, it's always been a great turnout here, but I'm particularly impressed that you're all here tonight. I uh, have distributed uh, a brief outline of the comments that I'm going to make, about which I'll have something to say in just a moment. But also, the second page is a copy of Article 2, of the Constitution, which deals with executive power or presidential power, and we may have occasion to take a look at that in the course of the comments and discussions this evening. Page one is just simply a brief outline of my comments. My responsibility this evening is a double one. One is, is because we're all here in some sense, perhaps, because we're concerned about or puzzled by the extent to which presidents, including the current president, seem to be making all sorts of decisions that you might think maybe properly ought to belong to the legislative branch. And, and is this an abuse of executive power <coughs> or not? So the first part of my comments is going to be just to provide the most basic outline of the allocation of decision-making power lawmaking power between 
the executive branch and the legislative branch in our constitutional system. The second part, which will be quite brief, is just to try to provide a little bit of historical context. Uh, what were the issues that were raised at the Constitutional Convention in the summer of 1787 respecting the power that a president ought to have in our constitutional system? So with that introduction, why don't we just get started? First of all, some of this is very elemental, but it's very important. It provides a basic framework to which we can recur in deciding whether the president is abusing executive power or is not abusing executive power. Basically, as you know, there are three branches of government. The legislature is supposed to make law. The president is supposed to execute or administer the law that the Congress has made. And the judiciary then will decide controversies and cases involving the law that's been made. So if the legislature is supposed to make law, how come we find that presidents regularly make law as well? Well, there are three basic circumstances under which the president of the United States is authorized to make law. The first is when the Constitution in particular, Article 2 of the Constitution gives the president the power to make law. For example, the president is the commander in chief of the armed forces. And in that capacity, he has considerable discretion about making important decisions without any kind of restraint by Congress. Okay? Congress has the power of the purse, but the president can make decisions as commander in chief without having any needing any special authorization other than the authorization in the Constitution itself. So that's example one. The second circumstance is when the president is authorized by statute to make law. And Congress is perfectly free to say, this is a problem that's going to come up on a regular basis. We can't constantly stop what we're doing and deal with those problems, we're going to delegate to the executive branch the power to adopt regulations, to implement regulations, to make interstitial decisions that we don't want to be troubled with. But we will provide the president then with a delegated power to make law. That's when the president has power because the statute authorizes the president to do that. For example, I'm just trying to think of an example. The, some of the president's decisions regarding immigration policy. Congress has probably told the president in a statute, the president may determine under what circumstances immigrants should be barred from entering the country and under what circumstances those <coughs> immigrants should be allowed to enter the country. Congress can do that, then the president has the authority then to make those determinations. The third example, or the third circumstance, is that in certain circumstances when there's an emergency situation and there's no express constitutional provision giving the president power to deal with the emergency, there's no statute that expressly gives the president the power to deal with the emergency. But in some circumstances, unless Congress has specifically denied the president the authority to act, the court has held the president has the power to deal with an emergency when it arises without any special authorization, either by statute or by constitutional provision. President Truman tried to use that in 1952 when he basically issued an order aimed at stopping a strike in the steel industry. He did so in a way that was in conflict with what Congress had decided, so he didn't get away with it. But that's an example of an emergency situation during the Korean War dealing with this strike in the steel industry. An example of where the president might be able to act in an emergency. So there you are, just three situations. Either you've got to find an authorization in the Constitution, you have to find an authorization in the statute, or it has to be an emergency situation. There's one other complication, there are lots of complications, but there's one other major complication, which is that there are a number of matters that the Constitution doesn't address dealing with relations with foreign countries. And there the court has said, generally speaking, the president has broad authority to act in making decisions affecting our relations with other countries, with foreign relations. 
without express authorization in either the Constitution or in a statute. So that's it. Now, if it doesn't fit into one of those categories, at least generally speaking, the president does not have authority to make law, okay? So, okay, so that's the basic framework. Now, historical context, very briefly. We need to remember that from the time of the Declaration of Independence, 1776, until the Constitution is ratified in 1788, there's a period of more than a decade when the national government in this country was governed by something called the Articles of Confederation. Under the Artis Articles of Confederation, there was, there was a Congress that went annually, but there was no executive branch, there was no judicial branch, so there was no president. So when the framers met in the summer of 1787 in Philadelphia, this whole business of creating a president, creating a, an executive branch, was all brand new. There hadn't been one at the national level. There had been experience at the state level, but no experience at all at the national level. And every single aspect of presidential power was up for debate. It wasn't something that we spent consistent time on, but from time to time they recurred to the question, should there be a president? What powers ought he, ought he to have? And that's how we get Article Two of the Constitution. Now, hanging over that whole debate was a concern that we create a president with extensive powers. It's going to be like recurring to the old system of a monarchy, something that Americans had fought to free themselves from. That's the one concern on one hand. On the other hand, there was a feeling that this Congress wasn't capable of dealing with all sorts of problems that come up from day to day, and you needed an executive to provide what, what the framers called energy or direction. You really needed an executive branch that could provide energy and direction to the country and then let Congress basically implement those policies by passing laws. So it was that tension, the tension between having a strong executive that would have energy and direction that it took to move the country forward, on the one hand, with a concern that they didn't want to create a strong executive because it meant sort of going back to all of the problems that they had suffered with the monarchy before the revolution itself. So, the big question is, what kind of controls can we put over the exercise of executive power, but at the same time create an executive branch that could have strength and independence and energy to act and carry the country forward? And so here were the questions, and I will just tell you what the questions are. They were very elemental. Should we have one executive, or should we have two or three? Some of the framers that summer thought we ought to have more than one executive. Maybe it's a good idea to have three. But others said, boy, you got three executives out there. They'll always be at each other's throat. It will lead to paralysis. You really need to have just one president. But that's a very elemental question, isn't it? How many presidents do you want to have? What about term limits? Should there be term limits? Some of the framers argued there ought to be just a single term. They don't want anybody to be sitting around accumulating power over time. Some of you may have seen the musical Hamilton. Hamilton stood up and made a beautiful maiden speech, didn't convince anybody, it was a very beautiful speech, but he argued that the president ought to be appointed for life so long as he was during, during what he called good behavior. Something that really carried all the way back to the notion, this is really, as one of the framers said, the fetus of a monarchy, if we go that far. So, what did they end up with? They ended up with an agreement to allow the president to have a term. They debated about the number of years. Some thought two or three years was long enough. Others thought he needed really six or seven years. And they ended up with four years to have a term, but to be re-electable not to be limited to a single term as a president. So these are the kind of very fundamental debates they were having at the convention, and if you look at Article 2, you can see what they settled upon. 
What about veto power? Should be absolute. Some of the framers thought the president ought to have absolute power to veto any legislation passed by Congress. Other framers said, no, that's giving the president way too much power. Uh, it ought to be a qualified veto, which meant that if the president vetoes measures, then Congress, by a supermajority, could override that veto, which is what they eventually settled for. Uh, what about treaty making and appointment powers? Should the president have absolute discretion to enter into treaties and to appoint cabinet officials and, and to appoint uh, members of the Supreme Court? Do we know what the answer was? Does the president have absolute <coughs> power? Power to propose treaties which have to be subject to the consent and approval of the Senate, yeah, and to nominate government, top-ranked government officials and Supreme Court justices, but again, subject to the consent of the Senate. Should the president be impeachable? This might be a current issue, <laughs> okay? They had to decide whether the president should be subject to impeachment, and they finally did decide, as you can see in the very last provision under Article 2, that the president, under certain circumstances, high crimes and misdemeanors should be subject to it. But every one of those are very fundamental questions that the framers had to address during the convention of 1787. And then finally, they had to, how are we going to elect this guy? Should Congress basically vote to decide who should be president? Should the governors of the states decide who should be president? Do you know what we settled upon and what the framers settled upon? What? <laughs> the <worst of> <laughs> electoral college. I left it out because it's the most complicated provision in Article 2, but it's this system of electrical <laughs> electoral college in which each state basically has the same number of electors as it does senators and representatives and they get together and then they had to deal with the problem of what if nobody gets a majority? What if there's a time? How are we going to handle that? In any of it, all of those questions are very fundamental. And then we get what we get in Article 2, which you can see is very, very, very bare bones. Uh, what are the president's powers if you look at Article 2? And I'm just going to leave it here. The, the president is charged with executing the law. What does that say? What does that mean? Okay. The president is charged with making sure that the laws are faithfully executed. Okay. What does that mean? The president is, in, uh, is, is designated as commander-in-chief of the armed forces. There's a very specific grant of power to the executive. The president has the power to make certain kinds of appointments, but subject to congressional approval. So very bare bones provision compared with, for example, Article 1, which gives a detailed list of the powers that the Congress can exercise. So what are the implications of that? The implications are that, I think Justice Jackson once said, trying to figure out the powers of the presidency is like trying to figure out what who was it that tried to decipher the meaning of a dream of the pharaoh? It was, it was as enigmatic, <coughs> enigmatic is probably not the right word, but it, 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 it's a mysterious process as possible. And when we read Supreme Court decisions, we find that the justices sort of line up along the spectrum. Some think the president ought to have broad powers, and they've got room to say that's what the framers gave the president. Others say, we're really concerned about a president that abuses executive power, and we find also justices at that end of the spectrum, and they tend to read the constitutional mandate very differently. So there it is, very simple, it's all there. You can read Article 2, you aren't going to find very much. I always like to think this like a cupboard. You go to the cupboard and you find the cupboard is there. There's just two or three or four statements that indicate what the presidential powers are, and that means future generations really have a lot of latitude in making those decisions. So, who goes next? Thank you, Peter. Um, welcome, uh, and thanks, Lynn, thanks, Kate, thanks, Rachel. Thank all of you for coming out on such a cold uh, day. Uh, and what I have to say will probably make you feel a little 
uh, more cold. Um, <laughs> we are in a period in which, as Peter has laid out, uh, in which the Constitution is not necessarily providing a very effective guide for resolving conflicts among the parties. We see this, of course, with government shutdown. And we often focus on the characters involved in the current scenario, so Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, um, Mitch McConnell, who's the majority leader of the Senate, and of course, not President Donald Trump. But I want to argue that the crisis that we're facing right now is actually rooted in developments that predate the current uh, presidency. Uh, and in fact, I will say Donald Trump is as much a symptom of uh, some underlying issues as he is a cause of those. And uh, we're in a period in national politics right now that we have not seen since the Reconstruction era, really. Three primary characteristics here. One, our political parties, politically, uh, particularly at the elite level, that is the level of national elected representatives, are deeply polarized. Um, and uh, that polarization pervades everything that happens um, in terms of filling in the gaps that Peter has, has very artfully uh, laid out here in the Constitution, those unspoken interstices in, 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 in the language. Um, second, that polarization is not shared by most people in the public. Most people uh, are not wedded to the ideology of the Democratic left or the Republican right. Um, and I'm not going to bore you with a lot of survey detail, but on issue after issue, when we ask people where they stand, if we give them enough choices, most people stand pretty much in the middle ideologically. And as a result, they don't feel that the parties are representing their views. Most people would like to see compromise. Um, they don't like to see this shutdown. Um, and third, um, the parties are highly competitive. We have uh, entered a period in which neither party is able to win over a majority of public opinion. This isn't like the New Deal, when the Democrats dominated more or less popular opinion from the 1930s and 1960s, or when the Republicans dominated from 1896 up to the 1930s. Neither party has been able to win this. And as evidence, when you think about majority control of our three major national institutions, the presidency, the House, and the Senate, there's eight different permutations that you can have if you think about the two major parties and the three institutions. We've actually cycled through seven of those possible eight configurations since 2000. And if the Democrats win the Senate in 2020, we'll have done all eight. In other words, the public can't make up its mind who it wants to govern. It essentially doesn't like any particular configuration for very long, and it says, let's try another one. So what does this have to do with the topic for today, presidential power? It has everything to do with it. Presidents are elected promising to do things. I'm going to build a wall. Mexico will pay for it. And then you get into office, and they find out for the reasons that Peter so uh, cogently laid out here, the framers did not give them complete power, at least not across the board. That power is shared under the Constitution. And they look to the legislature to accomplish things. But the legislature uh, sees no incentive in working with the other party because they share no common beliefs. Both parties are deeply polarized. There is no middle ground that they're willing to, to come to an agreement on. And so instead, all they're interested in doing is sort of staking out their ideological position. Uh, hopefully that will be rewarded by their voters in the primary and their campaign donors those small issue activists that put in their $15, $20, um, and they'll get a margin that will enable them to govern unilaterally. And as a result, nothing happens unless you have a supermajority uh, and you control all three branches of government. And that rarely has been the case uh, in recent years. And so the president finds out soon enough he cannot do nearly what he thought he was going to do. And so what's the alternative? If I can't work through Congress, if there's no incentive for legislators to come together on agreement, for instance, to fund the government, what do I do? I try to achieve things unilaterally. I try to achieve things administratively. I try to use executive orders. I try to issue directives to the executive branch agencies. I hope the courts will back up what I want to do. I want Lisa to talk about that. But there are two problems with this approach to government. One is it delegitimizes the role of Congress. Congress isn't very happy when the president says, I'm going to do things with a stroke of the pen because you're not willing to act. Um, and one way Congress reacts, of course, is um, by bringing court cases or people bring it on behalf. So we often find the judiciary becoming involved in the legislative process. 
Um, it also means that the president's um, effort to forge a agreement gets short-circuited. When you legislate, you must compromise. You must build coalitions. When you act unilaterally, there's no need to do that. You just try to assert that what you want should be what the government should do, and you make no effort to bridge differences with the opposing side, and so there's no incentive for that side to come and support what you are trying to do. Instead, there's every incentive for that side to try to block what you're doing unilaterally. Right? Now, the second reason this is a very bad strategy, in addition to sort of undermining the shared powers in the legislative process, is it's not very effective. We've seen this, for instance, with Barack Obama issuing DACA, Deferred Action uh, for Childhood Arrivals, or DAPA, um, Deferred Action for the Parents of Immigrants Who Have Legal Status. I'm not sure that's the acronym properly. <laughs> but he did this because he could not get Congress, controlled in part by the Republicans, to agree to comprehensive immigration legislation. So he said, I'll do it with a stroke of the pen. That was wonderful, as long as he was in power. Once he left, his replacement, Donald Trump, said, hey, I have a pen, and I'm going to wipe that out. And he repeals, he issues an administrative order, essentially repealing DACA. He's repealed um, temporary protection for um, immigrants who are coming here seeking asylum. Uh, and so it's not a way to forge durable coalitions, this acting unilaterally. So there's two problems with it. It undermines the constitutional um, process of lawmaking, delegitimizing the role of other players, and it doesn't work, not at least in the long run. And we're currently involved in a shutdown, and this is rooted in disagreement over immigration. Well, we've been fighting the same battle um, back to Ronald Reagan's years, um, but if you think about George Bush, George Bush in 2007 forged what he thought was a consensus between liberal Democrats and conservative Republicans on immigration. He basically said, I'm going to trade off border security, which the Republicans want, with a pathway to citizenship, which is what the Democrats want. Um, and he never even came up for a vote. Um, Congress filibustered it, the Senate filibustered it, it refused to go anywhere. And who blocked it? Conservatives in his party, liberals in the Democratic Party. Liberals did not want um, to grant what they saw was not going far enough for a pathway to citizenship. Republicans said, it's amnesty. You're allowing illegal immigrants to, to status when they haven't earned it, right? And so they got torpedoed from both wings of each party. And we're seeing this again. I have no doubt that Nancy Pelosi would love to come to the table and try to strike a deal with Donald Trump. But she would be attacked by her progressive wing, the Ocasio-Cortez and so on, who would uh, want to see nothing uh, like compromise with Donald Trump. And similarly, the Republicans, you know, we think Nancy Pelosi struggling with her progressive wing of her party. Um, she almost didn't get uh, chosen as speaker because of this. Her predecessor, Paul Ryan, and his predecessor, John Boehner, had problems in the conservative caucus who torpedoed efforts to come. So, you know, it's not simply the fact that the leadership isn't willing to compromise. Even if they are, they pay a huge political price here. Um, they risk losing their leadership position. Um, it's a scary thing to be a leader and look behind you and there's no one following. Right? There's no one following. And that's partly what we're seeing here today. So the key point I want to make here is we often view this current period of polarization as an aberration in American politics. It's Trump is sort of driving this. He's a divisive, polarizing figure. All that may be true. Um, but the reason he's president now is a, dis a, a disproportionate number of Americans felt neither of the two existing parties were representing their interests. <coughs> Nothing was getting done on the issues that they wanted to see addressed. And so they said, I'll take a flyer on a guy who has no political experience at all, but maybe, just maybe, he can break the logjam here. And of course, we've seen um, somewhat predictably that hasn't happened. But, um, and I'll leave it at that. Um, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you as well, everybody, for coming. And uh, for the organizers, thank you, Lynn and, and Kate and Rachel. Um, I study the judiciary, but I'm a political scientist, so I come at this from a somewhat different perspective than I suspect that, uh, that in many circumstances Peter does. And so I'm going to just provide some general overview of what I see as the judiciary's role here and the, 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 the pros and cons of thinking about what, what, kind of, what kind of power the judiciary might have. 
in reigning in the contemporary American president. One thing I think that is, is worth mentioning right out of the gate is that the power of the judiciary, especially the US Supreme Court, has increased quite tremendously over time. But that being said, the judiciary is still hampered by some inherent weaknesses in its place in the American political system in terms of separation of powers and checks and balances. And I'll touch on a few of those things as I make some of these preliminary comments here. Um, for, for a panel on this topic, I thought it might be a good, useful way to think about the judiciary's role in two different kinds of cases. There are very typical cases where the judiciary is ruling on the outcome of a president's policies, uh, policy preferences. So for example, um, you know, the judiciary ha it has ruled or, or it is in the process of ruling on things like Trump's policies with respect to transgender troops in the military. For those of you who paid a lot of attention to today's news, you might be aware that the judiciary has uh, begun to the, the process, at least the Supreme Court has begun the process of ruling on that, that, that policy preference. Um, other examples of this during the Obama administration, for example, the judiciary reigned in his power in the example of a presidential policy with respect to carbon emissions from coal plants. Um, so that's one kind of category of cases. And I, 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 I could talk further about some of those sorts of cases, but I wanted to also give some attention to the less typical examples of when the judiciary, including the Supreme Court, might step in and rule on the power of the presidency per se. Peter talked about one of those cases, a classic case that's getting an awful lot of play these days, is the Youngstown Sheet and Tube case, otherwise known as the Steel Seizure case during the Truman administration. Um, you know, we have other examples of these kinds of cases, some during the Lincoln administration. Uh, I can talk about some others of these, but there's a case from last year that I wanted to tell you a little bit about, and it was quite a bit lower profile than some of these big blockbuster cases that you might be thinking about, but I think it tells us something important about, about the judiciary here and in terms of how this administration and some recent presidential administrations in general have been approaching this topic. And it has to do with another power that Peter mentioned, which is the president's <coughs> ability to make appointments. There was a case in the court's docket last year called, I think the name is pronounced Lucia versus SEC. I'm not even sure how to pronounce the, 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 the litigant's name. It is, I think, an indication of, that this was a somewhat lower profile case. Uh, I'll try not to get into the technical weeds on this, but it was a case dealing with administrative law judges in the Security and Exchange Commission. So, you know, not a, 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 a high-ranking case in terms of salience in the American public. And the, the issue in the case was whether the appointment of these administrative law judges who were appointed through kind of typical civil service appointment protocols in the SEC violated the appointments clause in the U.S. Constitution. So why am I bringing this kind of low profile, somewhat technical case up with all of you? I'm bringing it up because to me what was fascinating about the case was how the Justice Department handled it. This case started during the Obama administration. And as you would expect, during the Obama administration, the Justice Department supported the SEC and how it had been appointing these administrative law judges. Then you get a new president with a new solicitor general. The solicitor general is the office, that office in the Justice Department represents the federal government in front of the US Supreme Court. President Trump's solicitor general completely changed approaches in this case. And suddenly, through his support behind the competing argument, saying that the way that these judges are appointed is unconstitutional. So first of all, this doesn't happen in such blatant ways all that often, and it might sound kind of counterintuitive. Why would the federal government's own attorneys be arguing that how the federal government was appointing these offices violated the Constitution? That's the interesting part about it. The second thing that the Solicitor General's office did in this case was even though the US Supreme Court had only said, we're gonna rule on this narrow question of how these administrative law judges are appointed. The president's solicitor general 
tried to get the Supreme Court to also rule on the president's power to remove these offices. So why might they have done that? This was widely reported as being tied into the Mueller investigation in terms of the president's administration trying to kind of uh, uh, glean a little bit their ability to push the envelope, not just on appointing people to various executive agencies, but also to remove them at the will of the president. But I'm not sure, I'm not, I, I don't know why the Solicitor General changed tax completely like this and, and tried to broaden the issue in front of the Supreme Court. But I want to throw one other possible reason onto the table. And it could be because this idea of vesting more power in the president, not just to appoint but also to remove people in his administration, is sort of part and parcel with a theory that has gotten some play in recent Republican administrations called unitary executive theory, which is this idea that all of the executive power, as highlighted, I'm glad that Peter circulated Article 2 for you so you can see, <laughs> that, the, that the executive powers are all, uh, uh, are, are all provided to the president and the president alone. So I think that was just one little example in a case that otherwise was not really worth a heck of a lot of our time and attention of how important these issues are and how various actors in this separation of powers game between the president and Congress, perhaps, might look to the judiciary to, to help bolster their arguments. The one last point that I want to make here, and I'll try to make this as succinctly as possible, is uh, uh, pulling back a little bit on perhaps your expectations with respect to the proper role of the judiciary here. And let me just point out a few things, and then I'll, 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 uh, I'll send it back to Lynn. Um, first of all, one thing to keep in mind is that the judiciary does not have, does not see for themselves a proper role in resolving every possible dispute. To give you one example that maybe doesn't have so much to do with the topic of the day on presidential power is the question of partisan gerrymandering. Uh, I'm going to presume that everybody knows what I'm talking about here. It's the drawing of legislative boundaries to benefit a particular political party. What is being litigated before the U.S. Supreme Court right this term on this question is whether it's even appropriate for the judiciary to weigh in on this question at all. So there are some questions for which the judiciary does not really see themselves as having a proper role. Another classic example of this is the impeachment stuff, where <coughs> questions about impeachable offenses or impeachment protocol is not usually something that the judiciary wants to or likes to weigh in on. I, 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 will, I could make a little just quick aside here that among my professional circles, the judicial, uh, the judicial politics people, a whole lot of attention now is being given to Chief Justice John Roberts and whether his status as the Chief Justice of the federal judiciary is giving him in particular some pause before throwing his vote behind weighing in on some of the most controversial issues of the day. As Lynn said in her introduction, my particular area of expertise is judicial appointment politics, so I always have to throw a little of that in here too. So the other thing I would say is, uh, in terms of any of these kinds of cases, cases dealing with the policy implications of a powerful president or cases dealing with the power of the presidency in and of itself, one thing to keep in mind is that the composition of the judiciary is changing on not quite a daily basis, but pretty close to a daily basis. And just to give you some numbers to back this up, I've got this in here somewhere. Within the first two years of his administration alone, President Trump has appointed nearly 100 people to the federal judiciary, including three, 30 Court of Appeals judges. And just to give you some context for that, that is about 17% of that court President Trump appointed in two short years. He also successfully appointed just over 60 district court judges, those are those trial court judges, on top, of course, of the two Supreme Court justices that he's already appointed. And when the last congressional session ended, 
there were nearly 100 judicial nominees waiting in line. The normal practice is that all of those get sent back to the president when the congressional session ends. My expectation is that the president will just send them all right back to the Senate. So I think the last thing I would put on this is depending on which side of this you look at it or how you would prefer these cases to be resolved, be careful what you wish for. Because the more things get thrown to the judiciary, keep in mind that the composition of that institution is changing rapidly too. I will leave it at that. Well, thank you all. I think there's a lot of meat there. Um, and I know you all probably have questions. So let's hold them for just a minute. And I just want to try and follow up with some of the issues that the league came up with um, that we thought it would be a timely, um, uh, it would be a, a good time to, to ask these, these experts. And I want to tap into what uh, Elisa was saying. Uh, these all, I think, relate to this unitary executive uh, um, concept, right? And one of the questions we had come up with was, we hope that you could elaborate on the president's national emergency powers, because this has been, um, there's been many commentators about this issue. So let's just see who, I mean, who of you would like to uh, address that issue? Um, and in what circumstances, now there's been legislation on um, national emergencies, perhaps you could fill us in on the background of that, and then the historical evolution of this uh, particular power that the president can claim. Let me uh, start by making a very basic distinction. The president may have powers to act in an emergency because Congress has given the president the power to act in an emergency. Congress may pass a law, for example, saying certain countries may experience natural disasters. The president shall have the power to determine whether natural disasters happen. And if that determination is made, he may allow those people to become temporary residents of the United States until the disaster is over. That's right there in the statute. The president is simply fulfilling the statutory responsibility. Why? Because Congress can't go around it and uh, spend all of its time figuring out whether a natural disaster has happened and so on and so forth. The other circumstance is where Congress has not addressed the question, but an emergency arises. And in that case, you'll find the court all over the place in determining whether or not the president has the power to act. But generally speaking, the president may act in an emergency if there's no legislation as long as Congress has not specifically prohibited the president from acting. So that gives the president broad authority to act in emergencies where there's no legislation that governs the situation. I don't know what the story is on on uh, the wall between Mexico and the United States, whether there is legislation giving, I suspect there's legislation giving the president some power to act in an emergency, but I'm not really sure. Uh, the question for the courts, I suspect, Lisa, would be, in that case, whether the president is fabricating an emergency to justify what he's doing, and they sh either should defer to that or they shouldn't defer to that. Okay. So, yeah, yeah I'll, I will just second that by saying that if, if, I, I don't completely know the answer to that either, right? Um, I, I actually kind of have expected that to have happened by now, if for no other reason than it seemed to be a viable way to throw this to, to, to the judiciary, the question of the wall, and in the meantime, it would kind of allow the pressure to be taken off, the government to be reopened, things to move on as the judicial wheels grind somewhat slowly as they, as they tend to do. I think the only thing I would add on to this, uh, from what Peter said, is that Times of actual emergency are when the judiciary doesn't tend to act at its best, right? You know, the Korematsu decision immediately comes to mind. That the judiciary does have a tendency to be more deferential during those periods. Now, I can't think of an example of where the judiciary had to resolve, is this the actual crisis that we're being told? I guess there's a slight corollary in, in, in a case called the prize cases, 
during uh, the Civil War when the Supreme Court had to rule on the, cons or, or did rule on the constitutionality of some of Lincoln's actions before any declaration of war had been given. But that's not the same thing as what we're talking about here. You know, it was easy in that case for the Supreme Court to, clue, to conclude, we are clearly in a period of crisis. Um, how they would muddle through that in this circumstance, I, I cannot answer. I'm going to defer so we can move on. These guys are the experts on this. Well, this leads right into another one of our questions, and perhaps, Matt, you want to address this, um, in terms of the president's war powers. Now, Congress has a relationship here with respect to the war powers. Do you want to elaborate on any restrictions on that, or if there are any any restrictions with respect to specific, like, nuclear uh, um, issue when, when he's attempting to use nuclear power? So I'm going to defer back to Peter and Lisa on this, because they both lay out. When Congress, what we've learned is when Congress has a specific statute on the books, um, the presidents are generally limited in what they can do based on what that statute says. When there's not, it really comes down to politics. Um, so when there is an emergency and there's no clear guidance from Congress, you often see the president trying to push the envelope yeah. as far as they can until somebody pushes back. And we saw this after 9-11 with George Bush and holding enemy combatants without um, any legal recourse whatsoever. Um, there is a willingness on Congress's part to sort of defer to the president, at least initially, and then ultimately the court cases as that immediate crisis sort of receded we see normal politics reassert itself, and some cases, uh, court cases, work through, and <coughs> President Bush was forced to establish, a, go back through Congress and sort of establish some rights for representation for enemy combatants. Um, so, you know, I'm, uh, like Lisa, I'm, not like Lisa, I'm not nearly as um, focused on the legality here as what the politics will allow in the area of foreign policy. We have seen instances in which Congress has tried to reassert through the War Powers Act, for instance, legislatively reclaim their powers that they've given away politically. And we found that those war power, that, that legislation has proved to be something of a dead letter because they lack the political will to back it up. So it's never really been invoked in any way that's meaningful. I would like to, you all put yourself in the middle of the Civil War. Lincoln is considering whether or not to adopt the Emancipation Proclamation. Does he have the power to, do, to, free, to free the slaves and the, and the still rebellious southern states? Uh, Congress had not authorized him to do so. Do you think he ought to have that power? Well, what power did he invoke? Do you think he invoked the war power, right? The, the, the power of the president as commander in chief, but it was a questionable constitutional position because you're pushing the limits of the powers that the commander in chief should or does have under the Constitution. So there's another example. So I just want to add one thing, and it's just kind of rounding out uh, an example that Matt brought up, which had to do with the, the court's role in the war on terror with respect to the holding of, of non-American enemy combatants at Guantanamo Bay. As, as Matt noted, initially the U.S. Supreme Court put up a little bit of a fight on this. And you know, in a series of cases, told the Bush administration, you've got to provide some sort of legal recourse for these folks. But what's actually really interesting about that, those cases is that in the years since then, the US Supreme Court seems to have completely backed off and let those cases be resolved by the DC Circuit Court of Appeals with the seemingly the government winning almost across the board. Whether that backing off is because of membership changes or that it's not a really comfortable place for the judiciary to be, going up against the, the sitting president for a prolonged period of time over an issue of national security is not where the Supreme Court usually likes to be. Okay, um, one more question we had was with respect to the president's pardon power. And are there any restrictions uh, in that? <laughs> I can't wait to hear what you have to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to give it to you straight. <laughs> Article 2, Section 2. The President shall have the power to grant reprieves and pardons 
for offenses against the United States, except in cases of impeachment. Okay? Who's impeachment? <laughs> well, <laughs> it just says you have to, you have to anticipate, except in cases of impeachment. So if he were to be impeached, can he be pardoned? from impeachment, the answer seems to be he doesn't have the power to pardon. In cases of impeachment, it doesn't say who, who is subject to impeachment. It also says for offenses against the United States. So you know what that means you do if you happen to be a member of the state legislature in New York. You make crimes by the president, crimes against the state of New York. And then the president does not have the power to issue pardons, only the power to issue pardons in cases of offenses against the United States. Violations of state law doesn't have the power to grant pardons, at least under the Constitution. Yeah, uh, let's see here. Um, uh, oh, uh, with respect to international trade. Um, what are what what is the relationship there between the legislative uh, branch and the executive branch in terms of you know we we know certain certain treaties uh, are approved by the Senate but there's a lot of leeway there. What is the current status of the president's ability to impose tariffs or to make you know the new uh, trade agreements? <laughs> so I'll give you a general answer, uh, which is Congress is very interested in trade policy, more so and less willing to defer to the president on trade policy than national security because it has distributional consequences. It affects their constituents in some regions more than other regions. And um, the Congress simultaneously is recognizing that as the 535 members, they're not very good at negotiating trade deals. So in sort of the aftermath of the Depression, they said, you know, up until this point, we have been the ones that have created tariffs. Um, and it just turned into a giant log roll in which um, a lot of protective tariffs were passed um, that viewed uh, sort of a, a total impact were not very good for the economy. And so they said to the president, listen, we'll defer to you, allow you to negotiate treaties, and we'll even give you fast-track authority so that when they come back to us, we'll tie our hands behind our back. And we can either vote up or down on this, this trade authority. Well, that trade authority has been rescinded because Congress decided they didn't want to be stuck in a position where the president could force them. So in theory, Congress, if they can summon the political will, has a, a much greater political incentive to weigh in on issues like tariff. Um, and, but, uh, you know, again, it's the question of whether they can summon the political will to do that. They have rescinded the fast track authority at this point. And as a matter of constitutional law, Congress has final say over commerce among the several states and with foreign nations. Now, what Matt has just said is Congress has that authority, they exercised it, and they gave the president certain kinds of powers. But that was because Congress decided to do so. But the Constitution is very clear that if Congress wants to exercise regulation over interstate trade, whatever form that takes, Congress has got constitutional power to do so. Trumps the Trumps. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we should get to your question, so. Yes. <laughs> the president is commander in chief of the armed forces. In many countries, the armed forces are used domestically to control the population. How are we protected from that? shall be commander-in-chief of the Army and Navy of the United States and of the militia of the several states when the militia is called into the actual service of the United States. That's all the Constitution has to say about that. Now, the framers were very much opposed to standing armies. 
You'll find that in the Declaration of Independence, which is not technically a constitutional document. So you could argue that notwithstanding this general power on the part of the president, if the president were to misuse his power as commander in a way that violated other constitutional rights and freedoms, that is an impermissible exercise of his power as commander in chief. I certainly would not hesitate to make that argument. Yeah, I think uh, um, the, the only thing that I would add on to this from sort of historical examples are questions of whether the, the president could do this by himself or whether he would need buy-in from Congress for something like this in terms of uh, how the, the military is utilized or would a president, you know, we, we know, for example, that it's Congress that has the authority to suspend the writ of habeas corpus. That's not quite the same thing as what you're talking about, but I think it's a corollary to this argument here. So I think very much there are sort of somewhat open questions here, but I actually think that, uh, again, you know, this of course all presupposes that Congress it would be invested enough to be able to get involved in this. But I, I would question a little bit how much the president could do with this all on his own. Let me just add a footnote. We've talked about the steel seizure case during the Korean War. In that case, President Truman invoked his power as commander in chief as a justification for basically the United States taking over the steel industry in order to get rid of the problem of strikes in the steel industry during wartime. War time. Justice Black, who was joined by the rest of the court as to results, said you cannot use your power as commander in chief except, he said, in the theater of war. The problem with that is it made sense during the Korean War, but today with the war on Korea. terrorism, the theater of war is virtually everywhere. But anyway, that was a limitation that the court imposed on his ability to invoke his power of commander in chief in the domestic context. So I would bring that case right, right up the flag. <laughs> I may be like a lot of other people, and I wonder every day what our current president has done that's legal and maybe has done that's illegal. I have no clue, and I'm not sure if we'll hear any of that eventually. But um, if a president were to do something blatantly illegal, wakes up one morning, does whatever, you know, shy of murdering somebody, who is the first whistleblower? <laughs> first goes relatives. <laughs> Who watches the president's every move to make sure that he's not breaking the law? How about the ACLU? How about uh, members of Congress? Uh, it is also possible that if he acts in a way that's completely, clearly and blatantly unconstitutional, even his own Justice Department would, would take some sort of action. But, but, but normally in, in our political life, we find, for example, during the uh, Second World War, when, when, when Japanese Americans on the West Coast were shipped off to internment camps, uh, uh, the ACLU brings lawsuits saying that violates the constitutional rights of Japanese Americans. It, it, it was a the court, what did it do? It kicked the can down the road. It, it avoided dealing with that in an honest way. But at least that's an organization that often brings lawsuits aimed at, at protecting our civil rights and liberties against abuses of executive power, unconstitutional exercises of power. So that's one organization. I'm sure there are others. I would just add that our Constitution is premised on this notion that uh, checks and balances and ambition is made to counteract ambition, and one of the famous <laughs> phrases from the Federalist Paper. There's an assumption built in that it is in somebody's political self-interest to check somebody else. In this case, think about the candidates for the Democratic nomination. Many of them have sort of uh, announced in recent days, and they've announced by saying, listen, my primary purpose is to check this president. This guy is, uh, has gone too far in terms of some of the decisions, and if you elect me, um, you know, I will reverse those decisions. So the primary check, I think, 
on President Jafar's elections, and it's people um, going to and voting, and voting in people who are going to um, act in a way that you think is, is proper in terms of um, holding people accountable. Uh, that's an important and undervalued, I think, tool that we have in this country. Yes. Yeah, I'm just going to second that. And I've heard somebody in the audience as well say you know, voters or something like that. I think that's right. And Madison you know, kind of called that the, the first uh, precaution and that, that it doesn't always work, so we need auxiliary precautions. Um, even that's not working perfectly right now, right? Because we had an election just a couple of months ago, and you, know, you wouldn't know it by paying any attention to Mitch McConnell, perhaps. But I think that is it. The, uh, the, the simple answer to your question, it's not going to be a satisfying one, is that it totally depends, right, on what kind of action it is that we're talking about. And um, the last thing I'll say on this is that with respect to the role of the judiciary, that as well is sometimes a problem. Because one of the reasons why the judiciary either can't or won't rule on some of these questions is that they don't believe that anybody has the legal right sometimes to challenge some of these things. And that is a whole other problem with the judiciary, which leads us leaves us with Congress and the Court of Public Opinion. Yeah. So uh, uh, another quick footnote, uh, there, is a, there are a couple provisions in the Constitution called the Emolument Clauses, Foreign and Domestic Emolument Clauses, that prohibit the president from using his public office for personal gain. That was challenged. That's it allegedly a violation of the Constitution when he does that with respect to Trump Towers and so on, using those to primarily generate profit from foreign, I don't know, uh, people from foreign governments who come. That, that was challenged by a public interest group called CREW. I can't remember exactly what it stands for. There are some problems there. They might not have standing. It was also challenged by the Attorney General in Maryland and Virginia or in D.C., I can't remember. So state law, uh, and that case is proceeding. Uh, so there are ways to challenge unconstitutional acts by the executive. Yes. Uh, just a footnote on the first question, which was about the president using the military for domestic law enforcement, because I know uh, it's making a lot of us increasingly nervous. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but. In addition to the Constitution, there's also the Posse Comitatus statute, which, if I'm right about the content of it, it says the president can only do that, use the army for domestic law enforcement, if there's a state of emergency or an act of Congress permitting him to do that. And I do notice Trump more and more floating the idea of emergencies. It's as if he's trying to get a looser notion of when he can invoke uh, a declaration of emergency. Uh, so for those of us getting nervous about this, this is, it sounds like a president setting the stage for the possibility of using army for domestic law enforcement in a looser way than we would have imagined. Great. Yeah. Yes, in the back. Suppose we're talking to a fifth or sixth grader who's studying um, the powers of government and how those things work. And the student says to you, how come Barack Obama didn't get to choose his Supreme Court justice? How do you answer that in good faith? Get to choose his Supreme Court justice. Why didn't yeah. Obama get to choose a Supreme yeah. Court justice? How did that happen? Okay. Well, the simple answer is because there's nothing in the Constitution that requires the Senate to act. And so there is no constitutional mandate that a nomination be handled by the Senate in any particular period of time. And again, that's the sort of thing that the judiciary would I, I would just not get involved in. Leave it up to the executive branch and the Senate to fight it out themselves. And if the student says, that's not fair. <laughs> well, sure, it's not fair. Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree with that. But it is something that the US Supreme Court would rule is left up to the political branches to resolve. And again, as, as Matt kind of got back to, and as I heard a voice in the audience mention, if you really don't like it, then take it out of the voting booth, is what I, when, when, when the sixth grader is old enough to vote. <laughs> not a satisfying answer, perhaps, but it's the answer. Actually, can I just make one more comment about this? And then, because I, I know that there are other hands raised. 
One thing that I talk about regularly when I speak to audiences like this is the importance of the legitimacy of the judiciary, especially as a branch with little formal power of its own. Based on the political science research in this area, I have been telling students for years that nobody, no politician would mess with the Supreme Court the way that we've seen them do historically because the legitimacy of the court is so high right now that that is a political loser. Obviously, I was wrong about that. <laughs> that not only did Republicans get away with it, but they were rewarded for it. And I don't know where we go with that. I don't think it's good, not even in terms of just that one appointment in and of itself. I don't know what that means for the place of the Supreme Court and getting kicked around by the other branches, but my sense is that it's probably not good. And is that, I just want to follow up, is, is that also the case with respect to these hearings on appointees and the lack of information that's, they're not really forthcoming, and the way in which we would hope, so we have some idea, the senators have some idea yeah. of what these justices would I think what I would say about that is that, first of all, political scientists might push back on that point a little bit and say that there actually is more information that comes out in these than you might think. I don't want to stand behind that point too much because I've listened to them in recent years too, and they're usually pretty dull affairs where the nominees try really, really hard not to say anything controversial. Uh, my answer might not be what you expect, but it's that I think that kind of points to how high the stakes are with these now. That they're you know, generally perceived as opportunities to lose your appointment, but so, so your strategy is to be as bland and non-controversial as possible and say things like, I'm just an umpire calling balls and strikes, I'm quoting uh, Chief Justice John Roberts here, and that wins the day. So that's back to Matt's point, that you have to be non-ideological in that context. It, I mean, the ideologies are so gridlocked. Yeah. yeah. So I want to get to the other questions. Yes, in the corner there. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, there's been some discussion about the authority of the president to, uh, to act militarily and to engage militarily when, when Congress hasn't spoken. And I'm recalling, I think correctly, that when um, the president of Syria used chemical weapons at one point, and there was a lot of call and question about whether Barack Obama should intervene militarily or should, or should commence an escalation of war in Syria. And he explicitly deferred to Congress. I think he did it for polit you know, political reasons, but it's an interesting example of, and maybe an unusual example of one of the institutional actors here, purposely deferring and not exerting, not claiming the power and I just invite comment on that. Well, I think you, you correctly acknowledged that he did so partly for political reasons and other aspects, for instance, in sort of leading from behind with NATO and overthrowing uh, Gaddafi in Libya. Um, he might have pushed the envelope a little bit. And again, the, the whole war powers, I think we've sort of talked about this before, is an area where potentially presidents have some greater discretion to take action, um, in part because there's a willingness to defer to them um, as to the only elected representative who sort of has a national constituency. So they're, they're the closest we have to a national sovereign. There's that part of that power resides on, they are sort of the quasi-monarch here. And so we, we tend to give them a little more deference. But a part of the problem too is, I think Peter alluded to this, the conduct of war today uh, in an era of war on terror makes the War Power Act so much more difficult to adjudicate. Um, and Congress has just been very reluctant when the President says there's a national interest at stake here militarily. Congress has been very reluctant or unable to sort of coordinate and act in ways that tells the President, well, slow down here. We want to debate this. Because in any of these issues, the President, uh, foreign policy decisions could have been, uh, Congress could have intervened here, but they didn't. Right. Um, and it, it's, it's a combination, I think, of um, the willingness of presidents to push in this era, this modern era of sort of the war on terror post 9-11, and Congress's um, reluctance um, to sort of intercede on that, um, or politically 
because of they're worried about the cost. Well, it, I mean, Congress has a, issued a declaration of war since World War II. And how many wars have we had? You know, I mean, Vietnam, Syria, Korea. I mean, it, the Congress has is, is just uh, abdicated its role in that. You know, uh, there has been no. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, that's my understanding. Well, Congress can also do things like pass the authorization for use of military force, although even that has, you know, just been relied on so much for so long for uh, actions that had nothing to do with 9-11, so I think you raise a good point. First of all, I agree completely with the way that you characterized Obama's motivation with respect to Syria. I think that was, I agree with you, uh, an example of trying to throw some of the pressure to Congress of like, I am not taking the heat for this all by myself. And that might sound counterintuitive, but I would actually argue that that fits a little bit in maybe kind of a reverse way Madison's argument that Matt brought up a while ago, which is that he envisioned that all of these actors would be self-interested. And sometimes it is in your self-interest to shove some of the heat off onto somebody else. And I think that was an example in the Syria thing. And again, since I always have to go back to the judiciary here, because that's what I do, I think there are a lot of examples in American history that can point to one of the reasons why the judiciary is more powerful than it used to be is that it's really appealing sometimes for political actors to shove hot potato questions onto the judiciary. Let's let them do it and let them take the heat and we can kind of move on to the stuff that will pull our coalition together as opposed to risk uh, ripping our coalition apart. So, yes. So it sounds like the backdrop for a lot of this discussion has to do with um, polarization and political will, as Matt talked about. And I wonder how much of that is, is grounded in voter participation, I mean, whether whether these issues that we're dealing with has to do with, especially since 2000, when we've been through seven of the eight iterations of government, whether we're really looking at uh, the, the, uh, the result of low voter participation. Or if we look back in history, were these issues there when voter participation was high? Uh, great questions, uh, <laughs> wonderful questions. Um, so there's, there's an ongoing debate about the level of voter participation. And when we talk about voter participation, it's not only the number of people who participate, but within that number, who participates. So we know a lot about who votes and who doesn't vote. That people, voting habits tend, to, uh, or propensity to vote goes up the higher educated they are, the wealthier they are. Um, and so socioeconomic status matters, and so you might ask, um, is that skewing the decisions they're making in certain ways? Then you want to know um, also so overall turnout because it raises questions of legitimacy. If not enough people are voting, then arguably the, our elected representatives aren't really representing all of us. And when we talk about turnout, too, we have to remember one of the developments in, in, in recent years has been We've lowered the age to voting uh, from 21 to 18. Of course, we, prior to that time, we expanded and gave the right uh, to vote for women. Um, and prior to that time, of course, civil rights legislation. All of those sort of open the pool of who participates, but not everybody participates equally based on that widening of the potential pool here. So what I would say is beyond voting, what we have is uh, the, the problem with elections isn't so much who votes, it's the choices that are presented to them. And by this I mean there's a whole pro We are right now in the process of electing the president of 2020. You don't know that. Because you're not even going to bother voting in the Vermont primary until, when is the Vermont primary? March 2020. Uh, but decisions are being made now. Who's making them? Donors, um, party elites, issue activists. They're all working behind the scenes to determine which candidates are viable and which aren't. We call this the invisible primary. What does this mean? It means by the time that important choice is made, the voters have to choose between, you know, in the nominating process, maybe six to eight candidates. And it's not clear that those candidates are really who they would have chosen if they 
had a choice to start of, but it's the people who sort of survived this, this invisible primary. So without sort of, yes, the, the, there is a question about political participation and, and whether turnout, which is roughly 58 to 60 percent of eligible voters now, is that good? Is that not good internationally? It's not great. And how can we increase that? We can lower structural barriers and all that. But I would say the bigger problem we have here is the choices that we're presenting our voters. Um, the, the elites in both parties are not representative of the views of most Americans. They tend to represent the views of people who are, and I'm not saying these views are wrong, um, but they are views that tend to represent the interest of a small, more ideologically um, extreme portion of the party. And when you, Joe and Jane Sixpack, go to the voting booth and they have to choose between, you know, and I'm exaggerating slightly, but some, you know, goose-stepping, um, you know, gun-toting, Bible-thumping, um, um, abortion-hating um, person on the right and some tree-hugging secular humanist um, you know, boy, latte sipping, fierce driving <laughs> person on the left. That's all the choice they have. They might want somebody in the middle, but that's not there for them. So when I'm worried about the political system, I worry a little less about issues of participation, although they're important, but I worry a lot more about the choices that are being foisted on the public. I'd like to go right back to voter participation because I'm absolutely actually told that voting takes place during a work day. And when you say that higher educated people tend to vote, it's because they can vote. How are you going to get off from your job to stay in line for four hours in a place where they're locking up voting machines, where you have no access to actually um, use that right that you are granted? So, I mean, I think that there is a, a lot of that system is completely broken and needs to be fixed. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree. <laughs> the, the cons my, my concern, though, is that in many states it's going in the wrong direction, right? That this, that this boogeyman of voter fraud is being used as an opportunity to make it even more difficult for people to vote. And lest you think, lest you think this is only something that's happening in the Deep South, New Hampshire has done this, okay. made it more difficult for college students from outside the state of New Hampshire to vote. You know, this is, you know, we don't tend to do this here in Vermont, but I, I, I agree with you that that is a big concern, and it's demoralizing to see in some parts of the country that it's going in the wrong direction on that point. It's, it's, a, um, it's a political thing. I mean, sure. you know, Maryland is a, is a liberal democratic state, and they're gerrymandering just as bad it's as, true. as Alabama. Yeah. Carl? I'd like to go back to Matt's recent comments on the choices presented to the electorate, and we've seen some attempts to change the way those choices are presented recently, the so-called jungle primary in California, where the, the candidates are the top two vote-getters in the primary, regardless of what party they come from, and then Maine has recently adopted for some election ranked choice voting or instant runoff voting. Could you comment on the potential for in innovations like that to make the choices more appealing to voters and then increase the voter participation of people in the population? Uh, yes. So the, the California, the the version of the jungle primary, it's it's, it, um, it's the it's, I think he explained it very well, which is um, the idea that in a primary everybody's grouped together. You can run under a particular party label, um, but it's not necessarily listed there. And then the top two vote getters, regardless of party, go into the general election. So you may have a general election in California in which you're voting between two Democrats. And the idea here was instead of having an extremist from the right and the left, the idea is you might have a moderate person as an extremist. And uh, it's very early in this experiment. One of the problems we're finding is a lot of voters don't really, haven't figured it out yet. They're not quite sure what they're doing. Uh, ranked choice voting you talked about in, in Maine, again, um, in which you sort of have a two-step process in which um, uh, there's, a, there's an initial vote and then you can, uh, based on how you rank those voters, the votes are recalibrated 
and the idea is to develop a consensus candidate. Those are all important structural changes, and certainly, I think, getting back to the earlier point about the same-day voting, um, we, in Vermont, we have tried to remove a lot of these barriers. Uh, my wife is a town clerk, and um, I can't speak for her. She's in the back of the room, but she'll tell you there are some ramifications if you're a town clerk to same-day voting. But she's learned to adjust to this, as most town clerks do. There's always trade-offs. So yeah, there are ways we know, like looking at other countries, one of the things that other countries do much better than we do is their, their political parties are much better mobilizing agents <coughs> because um, the parties tend to be class-based. So you have a labor party that will mobilize people of lower socioeconomic status. We don't really have that here. But yeah, well, let's, have, let's have a holiday, three-day voting, let's have weekend voting. All these things we think can bring up participation. Education, certainly talk to your sixth grader and uh, tell them about voting. I will point out some of the things that we thought were going to help voting have proved counter, effect, uh, counter um, productive. Um, interestingly enough, early voting. A lot of states are moving to early voting. It turns out that decreases participation. And we never really thought that would have. And the reason is voting is a social act. A lot of you vote because you see your neighbors voting um, or you start talking about it because election day is arriving, but if it turns out 30% of your neighbors have already voted, um, you're not getting that same buzz. And so political science has actually studied this and said, geez, we screwed this one up. Early voting is decreasing participation. Who would have thought that? So you've got to be really careful about this. But yeah, um, I think both those points are important points. Yeah. I'm really concerned about that whole issue of like which candidates are presented. It doesn't matter how well you improve voting participation if they only have rotten choices. And um, in particular, I'm very interested in ranked choice voting, which seems like it can be helpful either at the local level or at the state level if we're electing your um, U.S. Senator or representative, but you, it, does, it can't work with the Electoral College, and I'm not sure. Like you could say you could have oh, some other person decide to go and participate in the um, caucuses, but in Iowa, and see if you can get like a, a normal human being as a candidate. Um, and, uh, but they have to choose which of the two parties. And if they don't have a foothold in the, in the party, if they're an independent person, or if they're just not in the you know, elite of the party, then they're not going to get support and get very far. And we're, I just don't see how we're going to get past that with the electoral Well, I'm not sure that we are, but, but Vermont and many and a number of other states, not a sufficient number, have adopted uh, an approach called national popular vote. And basically the way that works is that uh, whoever wins the national popular vote, your state agrees to support. And is that the way that's Yeah, but that's still only a two-party system, and you still yeah, no, 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 no. I, I, I agree. It's still, you know, I'm sitting here feeling more and more depressed. <laughs> The one, the one thing we can conclude safely is that the system is not working the way the framers imagined it. They had this sort of nice approach. Congress will adopt laws. The president will have energy and direction and will carry the country forward by complying with those laws, executing those laws. But what Matt has described is we've got paralysis in Congress. And I'm, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, well, what does he want to do? How is he going to get us out of this? Does he want the president to have more power? Because if you give the president more power, you don't have as much paralysis, right? But it seems to me as we've talked tonight, we've moved, interestingly, back to focusing on the primary and the system that if we could only somehow correct the primary system, we might be able to, to begin to elect people that will help in Congress move us out of the problem. I don't know if that's what, what the suggestion is, but anyway, that's interesting. Well, I think, you know, just to quickly follow up on Peter's point and then uh, uh, turn it over, I think that's exactly right. I mean, there was this, we used to have this system of smoke-filled rooms in which party elites would basically choose who they want to run or run. And, oh, and, and sort of one of the big trends in American politics has been sort of this changing norms of legitimacy. And we, I don't think most of us wouldn't like that anymore if somebody in smoke-filled rooms chose our candidates for us. But you know what? When they made that choice, yeah. They said, who's going to win the election, and who's the most you know, electable candidate? Now, a lot of purists who are involved in politics are more concerned about who's the person who's going to toe my ideological line, and God help them if they try to compromise with the other party, because I'm going to run 
somebody who's more pure than they are. And, you know, the difficulty, I think, Peter, in, in getting rid of primaries and so on is it means restricting participation. None of us really want to do that, but the problem is when you open up the gates to allow participation, it gets back to your point, not everybody participates equally. It's the activists who take advantage of these, particularly very early in the process. And so sort of they're winnowing the field. Well, you and I aren't even thinking about 2020 because, you know, we're, we've got more important things to do. Uh, so I don't mean to be a council of despair here, Peter, but, <laughs> you know, and these are hard questions. And part of it, I think, and I, I defer to both of you, is that we're trading off different values. So we might, we might make institutional reforms that increase participation on the assumption that everyone's going to participate equally, but then they don't. Um, so, you know, that's a, a clash with the idea of good decision making versus widespread popular participation. Well, which one do you value the most, right? These, we, we depend on the political process to make these choices for us. And, um, you know, we can debate on how well they're, they're choosing among these competing values, but that's a lot of, I think, what's at stake here is, you know, a lot of competing values. So we had a couple. Did you have one, Michael? Or? Uh, now you folks make a living. <laughs> Barely. Studying some things. And I wish I could, but I don't have the memory. But I do, I do wonder if there are some countries where the women are in control. And how was that fizzled out? Or, or, or did it fizzle out? Or did it... <laughs> Right. Uh, boom! Uh, I, from my experience, I'm 84 years old. Uh, I know of many, many families. The uh, the gentleman is much stronger physically, but the woman runs the place, one way or another. You may have an answer. In, in Spain, for example, where, where you vote for parties, and uh, if you get, you know, if, if out of 100 uh, candidates you vote for, for, for Jen, they've got a provision that says out of every four candidates being presented by a party, two of them have to be women. Uh, so it's blatant gender-based discrimination, but it does the work, right? Uh, I don't know that we would accept that approach under the 14th Amendment, but at least that's one approach you can you can have. You can you can say out of you know at least you're going to have a mixture of people representing us in the government. So I can't speak with a lot of authority on this because I study American politics. But what I can say from speaking to my colleagues who who study comparative politics is that actually, and I think this sort of fits something that Matt was saying a little while ago, is that the political systems where elites have more control sometimes result in more females in positions of authority too. And to give you an analogous example in the American political system, it's kind of a narrow example, but in the states that elect their judges, for example, they tend to have less diversity on their bench than the states where judicial appointments are controlled more by elites. So I think that's another kind of tension between opening things up for more democratic, small d democratic input versus uh, uh, a drive for more diversity, perhaps. And one, just one thing. Uh, in the history of the United States, I don't ever remember of women having duels. <laughs> so the point you're getting at is a great point. Uh, <laughs> so we've done a lot of study of gender impact uh, on the legislative body at the national level in Congress. It's about 20, what is it, about 24 percent women now in Congress. It's incrementally been increasing, but it's nowhere near descriptive representation yet. We know a couple of things in these studies, and by the way, don't start Hillary Clinton here because the presidency is a whole other thing. Um, so I'm only talking about. Congress. We know this. When women run, they do as well as men um, electorally, once you control for the districts. When they are elected, they push a different set of issues than men do. Um, it's a significant, you know, having women in the legislative assembly makes a huge difference in terms of the types of issues that are debated. Generally speaking, women 
We know the source of the gender gap, too, in terms of voting. It's not necessarily, quote, unquote, women's issues. It's concern for the most vulnerable in society. Women are just more oriented, and we're not going to go beyond saying what we know about agenda setting. They're more oriented towards policies that protect the more vulnerable people in society, more so than men are. The question is, how do you improve, if we think these are positive developments, how do you improve women's representation? One of the biggest problems we have, women aren't asked. They're not asked to run. We've done surveys of them, and um, that's the biggest thing that's preventing them from running. Uh, men are just, they'll jump up and they'll volunteer. Yeah, I'll run. Women wait to be asked, and they're not in networks that naturally ask them, listen, you're next in line, jump to the front here and run. Now that's changing, but very glacially, and not, I think, nearly as quickly as most of us would like. Well, we are at the end. Yeah, no, oh, go no, ahead, no, Peter. No, no, you no, you no, close, no, okay? No, no, just, <laughs> there's one other way to get women and minorities to run, and that's to provide for public funding of campaigns. Mm -hmm. That is shown to be enormously effective in increasing the representation in political campaigns of women and minority candidates. Thank you very much, all of you.